Welcome to Tamara Tattletales. I'm Tamara and I spill the tea on your favorite reality stars. Married at First Sight season 14, Boston. So I was just in Las Vegas and I'm a little hoarse because everywhere we went, even the mall, had loudish music playing in the background. So I was constantly raising my voice to speak for three days. So please bear with me. <laughs> also, I recently noticed that YouTube held hundreds of your comments that they thought might be controversial. So I very recently released all of those. So for the record, I do not delete or hide comments unless it's like straight up spam. They showed Tootie making breakfast. Way to go, Katina. If he wants a home-cooked meal, let him make it himself. Later, they showed Tootie talking with his good friend, Jeff. Hey there, hey, Jeff. He tells Jeff that he's not sure about having sex with Katina yet because it may change how he sees her and the marriage. And Jeff is saying that he's surprised that Tootie is nervous about having sex. He's known him for 10 years and he's never known him to be nervous about having sex with a woman. Like maybe she's the one. Now y'all need to leave this man alone about having sex. Let him get his mind right first. So Tootie tells this story about Katina going to the grocery store for two hours and only coming back with bread and water. <laughs> she must watch a lot of old school prison movies. Anyway, Jeff advised him not to overthink it because she's not used to shopping and cooking for two people. And he said when he was a bachelor, he didn't really know how to shop for two people either. He told Tootie that he does expect a lot and he reminded him that he needs to accept people for where they are right now. And then Tootie mentioned that she's a food blogger and she likes to eat out a lot and dress up and try various restaurants. So that also explains why she's not much of a cook. I mean, can we just take a moment to give Jeff a round of applause for being such a good, smart, strong and handsome friend? Hey now! So Katina meets with her friend and she told her friend that her first impression of Tootie was that he was cute. She's like, he's cute. Her friend said that the day that they met and talked to Tootie, they only got to ask him about five questions and he just talked and talked and talked. She wasn't sure if he was talking to avoid their questions or maybe he was just nervous. I'm wondering if Katina's friends know he has ADHD because I'm thinking that played a role in their experience. Anyway, he told them that he's never been with a black woman. According to him, he's never found one that was attracted to him. Now her friend is extremely alarmed by this because he looks black. Katina reminds her friend that he's half Irish and wears a mohawk. I kind of hear what she's saying, that he may have connected more with his Irish side when it came to the women he's attracted to. And the way he looks shouldn't determine who he has to date. Not sure where she was going with the mohawk argument. Just because she doesn't like it doesn't mean all black women are going to kick him to the curb because of it. Now, later, Tootie came outside to help Katina with groceries. But before he helped, he told her since she wanted a man who looked close to Michael B. Jordan, he got his hair cut. That's right. He got rid of the frohawk. Mark is playing catch with his friend, which playing catch seemed pretty random. But anyway, Mark's saying that he likes how Karen is helping him with his mom and it's new to him to have someone who helps in this way. His friend asks if he's catching feelings for Karen because he usually falls in love pretty fast. He said no, the first impression was like so outside of the box that he's used to. He says we have like a lot of things in common. We have like a lot of things in common. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But then on the other side, she's loud and says things in public that makes him uncomfortable. He's thinking Karen is not self-aware and doesn't realize how she comes across. Oh, she's aware. Her father warned you about her while she was standing next to you. He said in the past, if he had had this many problems in a relationship, that he'd be out. His friend said to the confessional cam that he doesn't think Mark expected to be in this position where he's the one who feels like he needs to hold back because he's uncomfortable. Steve bought a pooper scooper to pick up after sushi. Okay, I see you, Steve. Showing off that you at least have $18.76 in your pocket. Go ahead now. Steve addresses her concerns about his not having a job at the moment. Now, Noisy says she needs to see action behind his words. 
On After Party, Steve said he has a savings account. I believe the real problem here is him agreeing to getting married in this way during a time when he's not working, whether it's for someone else or himself. Plus, he doesn't seem to be articulating what his current financial situation is. If you're sitting on bags of money, speak up, Steve-O. She'll stop tripping. We see Steve talking to the camera. He says, Noisy offered to cook him dinner for the first time. He noticed that her gluten-free noodles were cooking, but his weren't yet, so he threw his in a pot. When he went back to check on them, they were overcooked and the pot was like almost overflowing. And he complains about them being overcooked. I can't eat your noodles. And he's like, yeah, but you can still check on them. And then she grabs her dog and backpack and says, F this and then leaves. So based on what they showed us, here's my thing. If I'm going to cook you dinner, unless I ask you for help, stay out of my kitchen. If you decide you want to come in and start making stuff while I'm still cooking, don't be creating new cooking projects for me to complete when I'm over here getting my little Rachel Ray on. Was she going to make a different set of noodles for him or was it her intention for him to try her gluten-free ones? Who knows? Let it play out and see before jumping in. So the following day, he says he'd been trying to call and text her, but he still hadn't heard from her. He said he's willing to apologize, but she won't even give him a chance to. Later, she finally shows up to the house and he explains that he didn't know what was going on with her. He had to guess that it had something to do with the pasta situation and since they're married it's not cool for her to just walk out and leave him hanging. Then he logged into Instagram and sees this message she posted which looked like it was directed at him and she admits that it was directed to their situation. She said learning to say nah this just isn't good enough will enhance your life greatly. You're allowed to say this is simply not enough for me. You're allowed to have a vision for yourself, your life, your relationship, and refuse to settle for anything less. Say no often. Yeah, this is about more than just noodles. But anyway, she said she was offended that he would make comments about the noodles rather than say, thank you for making me food. And it came off really rude and it wasn't the first time comments had been made. She said she was triggered, there's that word again, and she shuts down, well, not her social media, when she gets upset. She said, you would prefer that I handle conflict the way you do, but I'm not you. He explains that the way she handled the situation was not healthy communication, leaving without saying a word, ghosting him, then posting their problems on social media. He asked, do you think that's acceptable? And she says, I probably shouldn't have posted on social media. He says, you definitely should have not done that. And she gives him a little side eye, like I wouldn't say definitely, like Pookie Nim need to know when I'm mad at you. Overall, she gave the impression that she thought leaving, posting her anger on Instagram and ghosting him was the appropriate response to his pasta complaint. I see why she wanted to stay in the apartment. At home, she has to sit on the floor to do her makeup. Since they're breaking up, Married at First Sight is making them tell their family on camera that they are getting divorced. So Chris breaks it down to his mom. He tells her that the wedding night after the wedding sucked and during the honeymoon, even though the room was huge and he offered to sleep on the couch, floor, whatever, she didn't want that. She didn't feel comfortable. And every time he tried to have a conversation with her, she'd walk away. The mom thinks hostage wanted her 15 minutes of fame. Chris says the more he thinks about it, the more pissed off he gets thinking about her way of seeing this as being worse for her than anyone else. He and his mom believe it was mostly her not finding him physically attractive from the get-go. Hostess meets with her friend who she rescues animals with. She told her friend, he's not my type, but I kept trying to push through and push through. But the things I kept hearing about him weren't the best things and that's hard. And her friend asked her if she and Chris ever had a chance to sit down and just even have a deep conversation about their wants and needs. No, it's a very small resort and everyone knew where I was at all times and if he wanted to talk to me he could have very well found me girl if you want to sit there and lie to your friend you go right ahead but i at least hope you're being honest with yourself behind closed doors she said i came back from my honeymoon ready to see if we could get on better terms and he was like this is the day i'm deciding that i want a divorce i just don't feel like he put forth any effort i wish we could hear what effort she thought she put in the friend said she wishes she would have been able to attend their wedding so she would have had her own impression of him because hostage tends to be hard on men. 
Now, producers pull hostage aside and ask, what's next? Um, I think I'll pack my bags and move to Texas. I think I'll find my cowboy there, but I will definitely talk to my psychic before making any big decisions. Hostage, your psychic has spoken. Your husband has an ego tattoo. You better go find that man. Throughout this episode, they both kept mentioning how much Pastor Cal helped them, but the only advice we heard was him telling Jazz to say I'm not your enemy whenever Picky started getting his little tone out of control. Picky met with his sister. He told her that the wedding was great, but they started to have conflict immediately. Now his sister had great insight. She told him that Jazz is a strong woman who is feeling vulnerable, and it's only natural to want to protect yourself when you don't know the other person. Plus, you don't know what her scars are like or what type of men she's dealt with in the past. He asked, so what do I do? She needs to trust that you got her, and it's hard to do that when she doesn't know you. In the meantime, she's protecting herself in her space. So Picky's like, so she doesn't trust me? Not yet, because she doesn't know you. Don't take it personally, she has to get to know you and feel comfortable with you first. Now, how is it that none of his sister's positivity rubbed off on him? So they show Jazz meeting with her friend, and she explains that her wedding was nice, but on their honeymoon, he used a tone that she didn't like. Her friend was like, uh-oh, you don't like any tone. I don't like no tone, don't use no tone, just talk to me. She said that she didn't like that he wasn't forthcoming about having a female roommate, that she didn't care, but now she's struggling with the trust. Her friend said that they need to work on their communication and that good communication comes from communicating. Girl, please, you know how many people will talk your ear off and not say a damn thing? Good communication is telling me who you really are so I don't have to give you a crazy nickname. Jazz says, my thing is when he thinks he's right, he thinks he's right. And her friend says, that sounds just like you. Jess says, that's not true. I can admit when I'm wrong. Not often, because I'm not usually wrong. They all had the obligatory housewarming parties with their friends and forced conversations with their spouse's friends, one-on-one -on -one to get advice. They ate, played games, blah, blah, blah. Oh, but I did want to point out that Jeff was there. Hey there, hey Jeff. They go to a bowling alley where they're bowling with these like snow globe looking balls and trying to knock over margarita shakers. I was curious, so I Googled it. It's called candle pin bowling and it's almost exclusive to the New England area. I guess it's better than disc golf. Anywho, Karen announces that Mark had his first taco the other day. Does he seriously just eat goldfish, hamburgers, and teddy grams? Jazz asks everyone how things are going and if they like their new apartments. Katina says she's impressed that Tootie puts the toilet seat down and Noisy's like, mm, I wonder what that's like. Okay, bitter party of two, your overcooked noodles are ready. So this launches them into a very riveting toilet seat discussion. Steve asks the ladies, do they like the toilet seat down because of sanitary reasons or because, wait, I have to step in as the nurse and safety officer because I have a real bone to pick with this. Jess says, wait, let him ask this question, Karen. Karen is like, it's spray six feet. Jess like, let him ask this question first and get everybody's opinion. Like, damn, sit down. Do you want the seat down because of sanitary reasons or because the assumption should be that a woman is going to be using it next instead of a man? <laughs> Katina and Jess like, it's because I don't want to fall into the toilet. Karen says, poop spray. That's all I can think of is poop spray in the air. And they all just kind of look at each other like, whatever girl. So Karen asked everyone how their visit with Pastor Cal went. Tootie said he realized that he needs to learn to stop talking at his wife and instead needs to talk to her. And Katina was like, what and what do I have to work on? Nothing. And Hostage said, because you're the best. And Katina's like, that's right. Better believe it. All right, Hostage, it wouldn't have hurt for you to throw a couple of compliments like that towards your husband. So Jess says to the confessional cam that she loves Katina and Tootie and thinks they are a cute couple. She said that they think that they are funny, but they really aren't. But as long as they think so, that's all that matters. Where I come from, we call that a backhanded compliment. Jess says that Pastor Cal ripped them a new 
Pole and help them to reset. And it's fine now. Now, I don't believe fine was the goal, but I guess it's better than where they were. Karen says that she read somewhere that you can't have intimacy with someone unless you've had conflict with them first. And Katina is rolling her eyes so bad that it looks like she's about to pass out. Karen asked her why she's rolling her eyes. I'm not trying to argue with you on camera again. Don't talk to me, girl. Stay over there. This was like a little deja vu moment when Karen was doing the same thing to Hostage and Hostage called her out. Chris announces to the group that they decided to get a divorce and everyone gave their little fake shock look. The girls have a group text going, I'd be very surprised if this is the first time they heard this news and that they never shared it with their husbands when they did hear it. This is really real for me and I just know that I tried my best and I just wanted this really bad. And Karen said to the confession cam that she was surprised that Hostage even came on the honeymoon and lasted as long as she did, but the weather was nicer in Puerto Rico than it was in Boston, so. So later everyone was bowling and Karen asked Mark what was wrong and he says he didn't like the way she spoke to Katina about the eye rolling and they get into the stupid fight about it. I don't like when you do stuff like that. This woman was rolling her eyes at me. So what? Given your history, you're just gonna piss her off. She was already pissed off. This is a team. I am a team for you. You don't think I'm a team player when I put on a hazmat suit for you and miss a day at work? He eventually gets mad and storms off. And she says, that's right. Walk away, call your mom and see if she'll let you in tonight. And he says, have another drink. So Chris goes over to talk to Mark and cameramen and producers are scrambling to get out of their shot. And while they're talking, a producer goes into the women's restroom where Karen is to talk to her, saying that she's sorry that he's not a strong man and doesn't have his crap together, that she's accepting him for all his flaws and trying to help him, but he's not congratulating or thanking her. She's like, real talk? He makes 60 grand a year selling gym memberships? Simmer down. All right, little boy, let me teach you how to be a badass bitch. Now, girl, make up your mind. Do you want a man or a badass bitch? Meanwhile, Mark is telling Chris that she gets even more amped up when she's been drinking. He said Pastor Cal told her that her husband is afraid to talk to you when you get a certain kind of way. Mark said he's afraid of causing a fight, so he just doesn't say anything. Meanwhile, Karen is asking the producer, tell me what other wife would put up with his roach-infested apartment like I did not hostage. Then she starts screaming crap about Mark at the top of her lungs and he and Chris hear her. She starts telling him that he hasn't given her an orgasm. I mean, girl was just putting all their business in the street. I seriously don't know how they're gonna come back from this one. 